If you haven't already, please take a second to subscribe to the channel, and also don't forget to click on the notification bell, so you'll be up to date on all videos released from the Everything Network. The Buffalo Crime Family, also known as the Buffalo Mob and the Magadino Crime Family, is an Italian-American organized crime syndicate that operates throughout the Buffalo area. They also have business interests in Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Texas, Washington, California, Canada, and all throughout western New York. Buffalo is located at the eastern end of Lake Erie, directly across from the Canadian border town of Fort Erie, Ontario. The city saw a huge influx of Italian immigrants from the 1890s through the 1920s, as the area provided plenty of jobs for immigrants willing to do manual labor. The local mills and factories flourished, as the city made use of the hydroelectric power gained from nearby Niagara Falls. The opening of the St. Lawrence Seaway in 1957 provided additional employment opportunities on Buffalo's busy waterfront. Buffalo is New York State's second largest city, after New York City itself. However, this does not include the smaller towns that should be identified as Buffalo, such as Cheektowaga, Amherst, West Seneca, Orchard Park, Lackawanna, to name a few. On a side note, Buffalo, New York, was one of the first cities in the United States to have electricity. Like many other cities, such as New York, Chicago, Boston, Detroit, and Pittsburgh, the west side of Buffalo saw the growth of a Little Italy neighborhood in the early 20th century. The east side neighborhood of Lovejoy also had a small Italian immigrant community. In the 1980s, the demographics of the west side shifted by becoming a predominantly Hispanic neighborhood, with the north side along Hurdle Avenue becoming the new home to the largest Italian-American community in Buffalo, New York, and the east side becoming predominantly black. Mobsters such as Anthony Casso, Lepke Buckhalter, and Joey Gallo, to name a few, either owned property in Buffalo or stayed in the area while on the run from authorities. Anthony Casso is said to still own property in the area before he died that may have been passed on to relatives. The first known boss of the Buffalo crime family was Buffalo Bill, Angelo Palmieri, who immigrated from the Sicilian town of Castellammer del Golfo in 1908. He quickly organized the Buffalo crime family in the Buffalo Niagara region. Palmieri was reportedly a respected old school mobster who resided in Niagara Falls. He took over the Little Italy section by extracting extortion money from grocery shops, push cart vendors, and Italian food vendors. He also led a group of black hand extortionists who preyed on both legal and illegal businesses, including the taxing of local pimps, prostitutes and drug dealers. Palmieri was also a member of the Castellamarese clan, which had satellite groups all across the United States, from the big cities of New York, Philadelphia, Detroit and Chicago, to smaller towns such as Scranton, Pennsylvania. Figuring he had made enough money to live out his days, Palmieri would eventually step down as boss of the family in 1912 and settled into an advisory role, giving way for Giuseppe De Carlo to become the new boss of the family. De Carlo was born and raised in Sicily. He moved to the United States in 1908, around the same time as Palmieri. He finally settled down in Buffalo around 1912. He lived amongst mainly natives from the Sicilian town of Castellammer del Golfo. With the same interests, De Carlo and Palmieri became close friends. Because Palmieri was a quiet person and liked to make money, he didn't want to get into an open warfare with other gangs. Due to this, many gangs in the city operated independently from each other. De Carlo would be the one to organize the crime so that the peace continued and everyone ate under the same umbrella. Their plan succeeded and as a result De Carlo became the new Buffalo crime family boss, replacing Palmieri, who stepped down after full peace was organized. Palmieri however stayed close to De Carlo as his advisor. They formed a strong duo and took over the Italian district and the labor rackets on the docks and now began moving their interests deeper into the east and west sides of the city. De Carlo is also believed to be a leading figure of the Good Killers, a crew of assassins which committed murder for hire in New York, Detroit, Pittsburgh and other cities where needed. The Good Killers is said to be the crew that gave Lucky Luciano and his associates the idea to start their own group of assassins out of New York, known as Murder Incorporated. The Good Killers was a group mainly consisting of natives from Castellammer del Golfo. In 1921, the New York Times made notification about a mysterious man dubbed the Chief, who controlled the Good Killers and lived in Buffalo. It is widely believed that this mysterious man was Giuseppe De Carlo. Some time later, Palmieri left for Niagara Falls and left much of the city in the hands of De Carlo. By the early 1920s De Carlo had lost his wife and the pressures of being the boss of the city was becoming very stressful to him. By 1922, future Buffalo boss Stefano Magadino entered the city from Brooklyn, New York. Magadino was welcomed by De Carlo and was taken inside and shown the inner workings of the organization. 
De Carlo remained boss of the family until his natural death in 1922 of a heart attack. Magadino eventually took over his business and stayed boss for almost 52 years. Probably the longest term of leadership in Mafia history. Giuseppe De Carlo's son, Joseph De Carlo, would also become a prominent member of the Buffalo crime family in later years. Yo De Carlo was once recognized as the Al Capone of Buffalo, New York. He had also earned the title of public enemy number one in the region. Even though he was the son of the region's second underworld boss, Giuseppe De Carlo, he was rejected as heir to the crime family, mainly due to politics. However, Joe would become in full control of the infamous Good Killers, strengthening his support within the family as the choice of underboss. He became the underboss of the Buffalo crime family in 1922, however, he also would become a strong opponent of Stefano Magadino in later years. Magadino kept him on as underboss to keep the peace between his faction and the De Carlo supporters. De Carlo would serve under Magadino for over 20 years. His rap sheet included arrests for assault, coercion, intimidating a witness, and violation of the federal narcotics laws. After spending many troubled years as a subordinate of Magadino, De Carlo and his underlings wandered, seeking new opportunities in Ohio and Florida, before returning home to witness the disintegration of the Buffalo crime family. Some say it was the Buffalo police and the harassment of New York detectives who forced De Carlo to leave the Buffalo area in the first place. De Carlo is also said to have operations set up in the Utica Rochester area of New York. In Youngstown, Ohio, Joe and his lieutenant and brother-in-law, Sam Pieri, ran gambling operations from the mid-1940s until about the early 1950s, but were either run out of town by law enforcement or possibly by the Pittsburgh crime family, who also held considerable influence in the area, along with the Cleveland crime family. Joe would later serve as acting consigliere of the Buffalo mob, while remaining the leader of the dissident faction from 1969 to 1974. He was reportedly not sanctioned by the commission, but was recognized by the Genovese crime family, which represented the Buffalo crime family on the commission. Joe would retire in late 1974, when the new regime was sanctioned by the Mafia Commission. Stefano Magadino emigrated to the United States in 1909 from Sicily and settled in Brooklyn, New York. In 1915, he served under Vito Bonventer as underboss of the New York crime family, the family that would later be known as the Bonanno crime family. One of Magadino's cousins from Sicily was none other than Joe Bonanno himself, the future boss of the Bonanno crime family, the family Magadino would eventually leave behind to become the boss of the Buffalo crime family. His tenure as Bonanno boss ended in 1921. In New Jersey, Magadino was arrested for his involvement in the murder of Don Petrino, a member of a rival mafia family from Sicily. Magadino left New York to escape prosecution, giving up his position as boss of the future Bonanno crime family. Magadino came from a well-known powerful mafia family and already had the reputation of a hardened gangster and ruthless killer upon his arrival in the States. He quickly established himself in Buffalo, New York, expanding the crime family's interests to crimes such as extortion, heists and minor narcotics. He quickly established his group of hitmen known as the Good Killers, led by Joe DiCarlo, as a powerful presence in the American underworld. He would eventually move to Niagara Falls, then in later years further north to Lewiston, another town on the Niagara River facing the Canadian border. Although he was successful operating his legal funeral home business in Niagara Falls, Magadino made his real money during Prohibition by running a profitable bootlegging business and by smuggling wine and spirits across the Niagara River into New York State, thereby supplying the needs of speakeasies located in Buffalo and Niagara Falls for visitors and tourists. After Prohibition ended, the Buffalo crime family made their money by means of loan sharking, illegal gambling, extortion, carjacking and labor racketeering. They also had other legitimate lucrative businesses, such as linen service businesses, that served the needs of most hotels located throughout the region, as well as taxicab companies and other service-oriented businesses. Under Magadino, the Buffalo Mob became an extremely powerful and influential criminal organization during the Prohibition era, benefiting from its proximity to the Canadian border and from the many underworld connections Magadino possessed nationwide. Throughout Prohibition, the Buffalo crime family had strong ties to Canadian mafia organizations in southern Canada, which supplied liquor to many of the underworld groups in the United States. The most well-known association was with Hamilton Mafia boss Rocco Perry. Perry led a very large group of tough Canadian mobsters and was widely known as the king of the bootleggers by the media. The Buffalo crime family held power in the underworld territories of upstate and western New York, namely, Buffalo, bordering Canada and situated on Lake Erie, Rochester, and Utica, along the Mohawk River as far east as Amsterdam, New York, from eastern Pennsylvania as far west as Youngstown, Ohio, and in Canada, from Fort Erie to Toronto, as far north as Montreal. 
Magadino led his Buffalo family through its glory years and its most powerful and profitable era in its history. He was an old-style boss who preferred to stay in the background and not draw any attention to himself or his criminal activities. Due to his territory's remoteness, yet the vast amount of it he controlled, and also being geographically insulated from the inter-family squabbles of the New York City-based crime families, he was held in high regard and was at times called upon to be an arbiter involving territorial disputes between other crime families. During the late 1920s and throughout the 1930s, the FBI in Buffalo recorded a rise in crimes such as bank robberies and interstate prostitution, which authorities felt was caused by mob activities in the area. As noted, Magadino and the Buffalo crime family became extremely rich and powerful during Prohibition. Magadino himself was said to be a millionaire by the early 1920s, his immense wealth and power would vastly continue to increase over the years. Also throughout the 1920s, Magadino had to make sure that his criminal interests and territory were protected from rivals. There were a large number of mob gang hits in western New York and the southern Ontario regions during Prohibition, mostly taken out by the good killers. Some were tied to the bootleg wars between American and Canadian bootleggers. While other murders were the result of the sugar wars between the Buffalo crime family and the Cleveland crime family. The sugar wars erupted when the Pirellos tried to expand their corn sugar business into eastern Pennsylvania and also western New York at the expense of Magadino and his group. However, after a few shootouts, Magadino's forces quickly put an end to the Cleveland mob's advancement into the region. This was around the same time when Frank Milano started to make his move to take control of the Cleveland mob. The Buffalo crime family vastly grew in power, wealth, and influence throughout the 1920s and early 30s and began to establish itself on a national level. Magadino had forged with other mafia bosses in New York, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Detroit, and Chicago. For 50 years, Magadino was a dominant presence in the Buffalo underworld. He was the longest tenured boss in the history of the American mafia. He was also very involved in national mafia affairs. Magadino was also charter member of Lucky Luciano's Mafia Commission and was sometimes allowed to make the final decision about disputes amongst the five families. Although fairly popular, Magadino had his share of enemies and survived several assassination attempts. In 1936, rival gangsters attempted to kill Magadino with a bomb, killing his sister and brother-in-law instead at 1651 Whitney Avenue in Niagara Falls. In 1958, an assassin tossed a hand grenade through his kitchen window, which failed to explode. Another attempt on his life was said to be directed by mobsters who blamed him for the failed upstate meeting in 1957, which was raided by New York State Police. Magadino had never spent any significant time in prison during his reign. However, in 1968, he and his son Peter were arrested and charged with interstate bookmaking. A raid on his son's mansion in Niagara Falls led to the discovery of approximately $500,000 in several cash vaults. This created great animosity between fellow mobsters and the Magadino faction. This led to a breakdown of their cooperation concerning criminal activities. The Buffalo family split into dissident factions. The leaders would meet in Rochester at the end of 1968, and by early 1969, top captains voted to remove Magadino as boss of the family, leaving him to lead a faction made up of his in-laws and older crime family members. Magadino had already been planning his retirement for a few years and start grooming certain mobsters such as Federico Randaccio, Josefino and Sam Frangimori to possibly take over as boss of the crime family. Stefano Magadino died of a heart attack on July 19, 1974 at the age of 82. He was buried in St. Joseph Cemetery on Pine Avenue in Niagara Falls. Federico Randaccio, also known as Freddy Lupo, was an underboss and one-time acting boss of the Buffalo crime family. He grew up in the city and attended Buffalo public schools until the seventh grade. He joined a group of DiCarlo followers as a youth and committed petty crimes as a teen. Following his 13th birthday, he was arrested after a gang brawl that took place on Delaware Avenue. A second juvenile arrest followed two years later. As a member of the DiCarlo gang, Randaccio became acquainted with Pasquale Natarelli, John Camilleri and the Pieri brothers. He also became well acquainted with the local authorities. He was arrested for gambling in 1925 and again for bootlegging early in 1926. One of the DiCarlo gang's biggest money-making rackets was extorting payments from bookmakers and operators of crap games. Randaccio became an expert at extracting payments from legal and illegal gambling enterprises. He was sentenced to 10 years in Elmira following a September 1930 conviction for first-degree robbery. Released early, he was returned to prison for parole violation and remained there until June 11, 1941. 
During the 1940s, he was closely associated with horse betting, operated by Joseph DiCarlo and John Trumalone. John Trumalone was a mobster from Buffalo, New York, that went on to serve as boss of the Cleveland mob throughout the Lick of Oli Nardi gang wars from 1985 until 1991. He kept close ties with the Buffalo crime family throughout his reign as boss, which started in 1983 after former boss Angelo Leonardo became a government informant. Trumalone frequently served as facilitator between the Cleveland mob and the Mafia Commission in New York. Since Cleveland was not a commission member, their interests were served by front boss Tony Salerno of the Genovese crime family. Trumalone also helped Salerno with other important jobs and business matters. After Joseph DiCarlo made his move to Ohio, Randaccio became the chief enforcer for Buffalo crime family leaders such as Vito Domiano, Angelo Acquisto and James Caputo. Caputo's 1951 death allowed Randaccio to step into the role of Domiano's bodyguard and collector. The deaths of Acquisto in 1956 and Domiano in 1958 drew Randaccio up into the leadership of the Buffalo crime family. In 1958, Randaccio was Magadino's chief lieutenant in Buffalo. He was also made overseer of all mafia gambling operations in the city. At that time, Pasquale Nadarelli became Randaccio's right-hand man. Randaccio's accession followed the mafia's exposure at the Upstate Convention and coincided with an intensification of FBI efforts against racketeers. Randaccio was targeted by the Top Hoodlum program, initiated by FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. His brother Victor and Captain John Camilleri helped establish underworld control over Buffalo Local 210 of the International Laborers' Union. During the late 1950s into the early 1960s, the Buffalo crime family was in a bit of internal war as some captains within the crime family would oppose Magadino's rule after the upstate mob meeting that was raided by New York State Police. Randaccio was one of those mobsters for a short period of time that went independent but quickly patched things up with the boss and returned to his side. Other who went into business for themselves soon met their fate. Independent-minded burglars, Frank and Fred Aquino were murdered in September 1958. Vincent Santangelo and Anthony Palestine also met their violent ends in August 1961 at the hands of the good killers. Later that year, after the crime family's narcotics trafficking became known to authorities, accused drug smuggler Alberto Agessi attempted to force Magadino to provide financial support to himself and his brother, who were also charged with drug trafficking. Agessi's charred corpse was found in a cornfield outside of Rochester on November 23, 1961. This was also a job handled by the good killers, who by now were made up of more American-born members. By the late 1950s, more informants were starting to come forward about reckless activities concerning the Buffalo crime family, mainly concerning Freddie Randaccio. By this time, he may have been underboss of the Buffalo crime family. It is believed he took over after the death of former underboss Angelo Acquisto in 1956, Randaccio was a highly respected and greatly feared gangster. He always was well-dressed and had a calm and relaxed demeanor. By the mid-1960s, he was running the day-to-day -day operations of the Buffalo crime family and was seen as the acting boss by law enforcement and the most likely successor to boss Stefano Magadino, being that the old man was slowing down after a long criminal career and was likely looking forward to retirement. Magadino fully trusted Freddy the Wolf since he was known to be a loyal supporter, besides the one incident after the upstate mafia meeting. Coming up from a soldier in the 1930s, then promoted to captain in the 1940s and also overseer of local and southern Ontario rackets. By the mid-1950s, he was underboss with the top Buffalo area captains reporting to him, and by the early 1960s, all the captains throughout western New York reported to Freddy the Wolf. He also worked closely with up-and-coming captain, Joseph Todoro. Todoro controlled bookmaking operations with his son Joseph Jr. and brother Richard. Joseph Sr. was a highly respected member of the family. He was also a big earner with interests in bookmaking and gambling. They also ran a profitable pizza enterprise that still continues to operate in the city today. Freddy Randaccio was very hands-on and kept close contact with all the captains in the Buffalo crime families. He sometimes ran operations out of the Blue Banner Social Club located on Prospect Avenue and run by soldier Benny Spano. High-stake gambling games were also ran out of the social club. Randaccio usually met with crime family members there late in the afternoon or at night. On May 8, 1967, the FBI received a tip from an informant that another well-known Buffalo crime family hangout, Panero's Lounge, was being used as a strip club and that high-stake gambling would also take place there and that most of the top crime family members were usually in attendance. Soon after receiving another tip, the FBI raided the lounge and made a number of key arrests. 
The media called it the Little Appalachian Raid, being that a who's who of top Buffalo crime family members were arrested that night. Over 30 mob members were arrested included acting boss, Freddy Randaccio, Captain Joseph Fino, a future boss, Daniel Sansonese, a future acting underboss Ampieri, Samuel Frangimori, Pasquale Natarelli, top enforcer John Camilleri, overseer of labor and union rackets, Jimmy LaDuca, and Rosario Carlisi, brother of former Chicago outfit boss, Sam Carlisi. They all were charged with consorting with known criminals, amongst other smaller chargers that didn't stick. At the time of the arrests, Randaccio flew into a rage and cursed law enforcement officers. The charges were later dismissed, but Randaccio's behavior and the failure of his political connections to warn him of the raid drew the eye of boss Stefano Magadino. Captain Joseph Totoro was also present and was arrested, alongside his fellow mobsters. Totoro was so outraged over the arrest and the fact that the lounge lost its liquor license and went out of business that he filed a lawsuit against the local FBI, alleging they were discriminating against people of Italian descent. His actions were supported by the former Italian-American Civil Rights League, formed by former New York Colombo crime family boss, Joseph Colombo. The lawsuit was eventually dismissed. Another huge blow was dealt to the crime family when in 1967, acting boss and successor to Buffalo crime family, Freddy Randaccio was arrested, along with captain and right-hand man, Patsy Natarelli on June 29, 1967. They were arrested on charges of planning and carrying out robberies due to the first known Buffalo defector, soldier Pasquale Calabrese. Calabrese's testimony sent Randaccio and Natarelli to prison. They were convicted and sentenced to a 20-year prison term in December of 1967. It is alleged that Peter Magadino took over as acting underboss for approximately a year after Randaccio's downfall. Freddy Randaccio was one of the most powerful and influential mafia members in the 1950s and 60s and would most certainly have taken over the crime family when Magadino retired, but instead he spent 12 years in prison. He was paroled on June 28, 1979. However, he never again was a prominent member of the Buffalo underworld as he retired to live out his last years in Buffalo. He lived a long time after his mob days and died peacefully on October 4, 2004, at the age of 97. By 1968, Stefano Magadino found himself deeply involved in a New York mob conflict, which became known as the Bananas War. This war pitted the powerful mafia boss and Charter Commission member, Joe Bonanno, against a rebel faction within his own crime family, known as the Gallo Brothers. Joe was also at war with current leaders of the commission, which included Bonanno's own cousin, Stefano Magadino himself. The Bananas War lasted roughly four years, between Joe Bonanno and his brother-in-law, Gaspar de Gregorio, who Magadino supported in his rebellion against Bonanno. This kept Magadino closely involved in New York mob affairs and away from Buffalo mob business. At the same time, a new regime was starting to muscle in for control of the Buffalo crime family. Allegedly on the night of October 20, 1964, Magadino sent his son Peter and his brother Nino to Manhattan to kidnap his cousin Joe Bonanno. Apparently the kidnapping was successful, and Magadino held Bonanno captive for six weeks in upstate New York while they discussed the current conflict within the New York underworld. It was allegedly decided that Bonanno would officially retire and relinquish control of his crime family to De Gregorio, but this would not hold, as Bonanno did not keep his word. Bonanno returned to New York in early 1965 to lead his forces in the war. The events surrounding Magadino's involvement in the war resulted in the commission losing respect for the Buffalo crime family boss. Many of the bosses looked at Magadino as the prime instigator of the rebellion within the Bonanno crime family. The commission even blamed him for the conflicts within his own crime family. By the late 1960s, many of Magadino's top underlings and crime family members began to believe that the boss had become paranoid and notoriously greedy with old age. They also felt he was losing the respect of all his underlings. This notion was reinforced when Magadino informed his top captains that their share of the crime family's profits would be reduced and he could no longer afford to give the yearly Christmas bonus of $50,000. This angered the top captains including Joe Fino, Sam Pieri and Danny Sansonese, since Magadino's personal sports betting book was one of the largest in western New York and was known to bring in anywhere from $20,000 to $30,000 weekly. This incident, along with learning about the cash found in the cash vaults discussed earlier from the raid on the Magadino's home, was the final reason for rebellion against Magadino. Buffalo Mafia members wanted to kill the boss but feared the retribution they would receive from the commission for an unsanctioned hit of a mob boss. In place of the hit, the Buffalo crime family's top members were no longer loyal to Magadino and agreed to replace him as boss. The Buffalo crime family at this time consisted of over 60 made members and over 250 associates, with an effective hit squad to deal with issues of the underworld, but was now made up of four subgroups. 
The Magadino loyalists included former underboss, who was incarcerated at the time, Freddy Randaccio, the current consigliere, Antonio Magadino, captains, Peter Magadino, Jimmy Laduca, Roy Carlisi, Vincent Scro and Charles Montana, all but Carlisi were related to Magadino in some way. The two largest and most powerful factions were the Pieri Frangimori faction and the Fino Sansonese faction, led by Captain Sam Pieri, Sam Frangimori, Joe Fino and Danny Sansonese. The Pieri Frangimori faction included captains, Joe DiCarlo, Joe Pieri Sr., John Johnny Ray Pieri, who was incarcerated at the time, Anthony Tony Romano, and Toronto, Ontario soldier, Paul Volp. The Fino Sansonese faction included the Totoro faction, John Camilleri, and Pat Natarelli who was also incarcerated at the time. The final faction was the Rochester faction, led by Captain Frank Valenti. Frank used this opportunity and his close affiliation to his father-in-law, Pittsburgh crime family captain, Antonio Repepi, to announce that the Rochester crew would no longer be under the Buffalo crime family's control and would be its own crime family moving forward. The rest of the captains such as Benjamin Nicoletti of Niagara Falls, Albert Bilateri of Buffalo, and Joseph Falcone of Utica, New York, lined up behind one of the three Buffalo factions. Canadian captains, John Papalia of Hamilton, Ontario, Santo Sabetta and Jack Lapino stayed relatively neutral, but were in actuality Magadino supporters, as they stayed loyal to whoever was the official boss at the time. Former FBI agent Joe Griffin stated that in the beginning of 1969, he learned through informants that Sam Pieri had been elected as acting boss in January of 1969. In April of that year, FBI surveillance captured Buffalo crime family members, Sam Pieri, Joe Fino, Joe DiCarlo Jr., Sam Frangimori and Danny Sansonese, meeting on the west side of Manhattan with Genovese crime family leaders. As noted earlier, the Genovese crime family represents the Buffalo crime family on the commission, and New York needed to be alerted that the Buffalo captains no longer recognized Stefano Magadino as the boss of the crime family. The Genovese crime family leaders affirmed their recognition of the dissident leaders and sanction a vote in Buffalo to elect an acting boss until an official leader was chosen. According to the Senate hearing report, the top Buffalo crime family members met on July 9, 1969 and elected Sam Pieri as acting boss, Joe Fino remained under boss, a promotion he allegedly received in June 1968, a year after the arrest of Randaccio. Joe DiCarlo Jr. was named the acting consigliere. The Buffalo crime family had never had an internal conflict of this scale or any revolt in its roughly 50-year history, but now the crime family was split and no longer the large strong unified crime family it once was. It stayed this way for roughly a decade and a half. Over the next four years, until the opportunity for the commission to choose a new boss arrived, the Buffalo crime family would still officially be under the rule of Stefano Magadino, but there were a succession of acting bosses, starting with Sam Pieri from January 1969 until he was soon convicted and jailed on September 25, 1970 and sentenced to five years. The Pieri brothers, John and Joe, became members of the DiCarlo gang, working for their brother-in-law Joseph DiCarlo, extorting payments from operators of craps games and bookmaking parlors. Pieri earned the respect of Buffalo crime boss by imposing mob discipline upon a relative. The Latempio brothers, cousins of the Pieris, were believed responsible for a May 1936 bombing that took the life of Magadino's sister. The Latempios were rebelling against a Magadino-imposed tax on their gambling rackets. Pieri arranged for Frank Latempio to attend the wedding of a relative in Buffalo. Following the reception, Pieri escorted Latempio to his car. After a short conversation, Pieri shook Latempio's hand and turned away. Two men emerged from a nearby parked vehicle and shot Latempio to death. The 1949 disappearance of gambler Patsy Cugliano was also linked to Pieri. Cugliano was deeply in debt to the higher ups, and Pieri reportedly was to transport him to meet with Joseph DiCarlo in Cleveland on the day he disappeared. In the early 1950s, a three-year FBI investigation pointed to Sam Pieri and Salvador Rizzo as the regional leaders of a heroin, marijuana, and cocaine smuggling ring involving Buffalo, New York City, Los Angeles and Cleveland. Pieri and Rizzo were arrested May 22, 1954. Charges against Rizzo were dismissed. Pieri was convicted and sentenced to 10 years in Atlanta Federal Prison. He was released May 7, 1963. The prison term enhanced Pieri's stature in the underworld. Within the institution's walls, he established strong relationships with members of the Profasi and Genovese crime family. He became especially close to jailed crime boss Vito Genovese. Upon Pieri's release, law enforcement officials wondered if he might become more powerful than Magadino faction underboss Freddy Randaccio or possibly Magadino himself. The Magadino organization was staggered by the imprisonment of Randaccio and Pasquale Natarelli in December of 1967. 
Pieri and De Carlo took advantage of the situation, mobilizing elements of the old De Carlo, such as a faction of the Good Killers, gang to take full control of gambling rackets in Buffalo. Pieri started to come under heavy investigation. Pieri, Anthony Romano and Ralph Jacobs stood trial in 1970 for transporting stolen jewelry. As the state was concluding its case, authorities heard evidence that Pieri had attempted to bribe a juror. A mistrial was declared and Pieri was charged with obstruction of justice. He was convicted of jury tampering and sentenced to five years in federal prison. When paroled in December 1973, he immediately returned to his top position within the Buffalo crime family. Captain John Camilleri's brief challenge to Pieri's leadership ended with Camilleri's murder on May 8, 1974. On the evening of May 8, 1974, Camilleri celebrated his birthday with friends at the Buffalo's Roseland restaurant. He left briefly to attend a wake and then went back to the restaurant. As he stepped out of his car, a light-colored sedan squealed to a stop behind him. A man armed with a 38 caliber revolver jumped out of the sedan and fired three shots, leaving Camilleri dead on the sidewalk. Pieri would stay dealing with legal issues throughout most of his reign, which left Joe Fino who was promoted to acting boss and Danny Sansonese as acting underboss. However, on September 15, 1971, Joe Fino and his brother Nick Fino were arrested on gambling charges and released on bail until the hearing. This diminished the Fino Sansonese faction's power. Danny Sansonese was arrested in early 1972 and convicted of jury tampering, which gave the Pieri Frangimori faction the ability to take over from the weakened Fino Sansonese faction. Joe Fino stepped down as acting boss in July 1972, but stayed on as official underboss to the new acting boss, Sam Frangimori. Joe DiCarlo Jr. has been the official consigliere since the death of Nino Magadino in 1971. The Buffalo crime family continued with its criminal interests and legitimate business ventures and stayed in solid control of the area's rackets throughout the early 1970s, including the local and upstate New York area construction, labor and union rackets it has controlled for decades. Longtime Buffalo crime family captain John Camilleri was the overseer of the labor and union rackets in the Buffalo area since the late 1940s and was an influential crime family member. Camilleri was born in Italy in 1905. He arrived in the Buffalo area with his family in 1910. By the mid to late 1920s, he was a Buffalo crime family associate, and in 1930, he was arrested for grand larceny. Over the next few years his rap sheet included burglary, robbery, extortion and intent to kill. In 1933 he was sent to Elmira on a 20-year sentence. Paroled in 1939, he soon became a made man in the Buffalo crime family. He obtained a mid-level position in Buffalo Local 210 for handling union problems as a lieutenant for Stefano Magadino. His power and influence within the Buffalo crime family grew steadily as he had interests in gambling activities, construction companies, and union activities, while at the same time gaining a reputation as a dependable man who could get the job done. He stayed out of trouble until 1971 when he was caught lying to a grand jury about his association to Buffalo mobsters, Joe and Nick Fino, during their troubles concerning the gambling charges. The Buffalo crime family, like so many other mafia families, were deeply involved in labor and union racketeering. Buffalo's local 210 had become a well-known haven for crime family members and their relatives. It was rumored that former crime family associate, Ron Fino, was elected to his post within local 210 through the efforts of John Camilleri. As a reward, Camilleri expected a high-level executive position within the union, but Fino turned him down. Camilleri was greatly angered by Fino's rejection and decided to plea his case in front of the acting crime family hierarchy, which since 1974 was clearly in control of all crime family activities and operations, as Stefano Magadino had been fairly ill over the last year. Sam Pieri had been paroled in early 1974, but it is not clear exactly what his position was, as some law enforcement believe he was the acting boss or just a retired advisor, while others believe that Sam Frangimori was still the leader at this time, Either way, both men were present on May 8, 1974, when Camilleri was allowed to plead his case in a Buffalo cigar shop. The leadership denied his request, and he stormed out of the meeting. Later that night is when his murder took place as mentioned earlier. Several customers ran outside just in time to see a car speeding down Chenango Street. The killing of Camilleri was seen as a part of the Pieri Frangimori faction's final bid to take over the Buffalo crime family, knowing that official boss Stefano Magadino would soon die, which happened on June 19, 1974. Frank Valenti was the founder of the Rochester crime family, he ran the family from 1964 until 1972. 
The organization was formed with help from the Pittsburgh crime family, and in the beginning they operated within the Buffalo crime family. Valenti was the mastermind behind the Columbus Day bombings. This was a tactic to draw away law enforcement from the crime family that was feeling heat from the law at the time. He was also one of the last surviving attendees of the infamous conference in upstate New York. Frank Valenti was born in 1911 and began his criminal career inside street gangs, committing petty crimes. Since 1933 he had several arrests that including extortion, counterfeiting and bootlegging. During the 1950s, Valenti became a well-earning member of the Pittsburgh crime family, which was then under the command of John LaRocca. He became a crew member of Antonio Repepi, the father-in-law of his brother. When Valenti's brother started to run a crew in Rochester and took over the criminal activities there, Frank was also sent over to help. The Rochester territory however was mainly in the hands of the Buffalo crime family and Stefano Magadino, but they were allegedly authorized by the commission to operate there. During this period he also became associated with the Bonanno crime family. While working in his brother's crew, Frank began to run the gambling, prostitution and extortion rackets. In 1957 he and his brother were invited at Joseph Barber's ranch in upstate New York to attend a large mafia meeting. Both got arrested when the police suddenly raided the meeting. Both were jailed. During their absence in Rochester one of their crew members, Jay Crusoe, took his shot and started a takeover of the family. Valenti tried to put an end to the rebellion, but was arrested shortly after for violation of New York state election laws. He pleaded guilty and was sentenced to stay away from the state of New York for three years. Informers later revealed that the arrest was set up by Valenti enemies who wanted him out of Rochester. In 1964, backed by associates of the Pittsburgh crime family, he eventually returned to Rochester with the objective to get rid of Jay Crusoe and to regain control of the family. Not much later Russo disappeared, never to be seen again. During the late 1960s, Stefano Magadino started to have troubles within his own organization. A few members under the leadership of Sam Pieri, a high-ranking mobster in the Buffalo crime family, wanted to remove the aging Magadino as boss of the family. In 1968 a group of Buffalo captains went to the farmhouse of Valenti in Rochester to discuss the future of the family. Amongst them were Sam Pieri himself and future boss Joseph Totoro. Valenti also reputedly rebelled against Magadino until he and Antonio Repepi, a Laraca family captain, announced that the Valentis would no longer be under the influence of the Buffalo crime family. Stefano Magadino gave his blessing to the independence of the Valenti group but demanded that they keep paying tributes to him. Both agreed and Valenti took no more part in the feud. In 1970 a newly made captain named Salvador Gangelo had collected a total sum of $100,000 in deposits for a gambling junket to Las Vegas. The money however, vanished. Both Gangelo and Valenti underboss Samuel Rosati blamed a man named William Lupo, a former associate of Jake Russo. Lupo was murdered shortly after. During this period law enforcement kept a close eye on the Valenti family as they noticed criminal activities were increasing in Rochester. Valenti started to feel the heat, he knew he had to draw attention away from his organization. On October 12, 1970, bombs were detonated at two local churches, the Monroe County Office Building, the U.S. Courthouse, the Federal Building, and at the home of a Union official. Police suspected anti-Vietnam protesters and radical groups, drawing attention away from Valenti's organization. Another benefit of their action which followed was that Valenti's enemies, who knew he was behind the bombings, were shaken by his hard measures. Valenti was pleased that his actions worked and had six more bombings carried out between October 27 and December 14 that same year. In 1975 the truth behind the bombings was revealed. Salvador Gangelo and soldier Eugene de Francesco, who carried out the bombings, were amongst the men arrested in the aftermath. Valenti was also indicted, but because of ill health did not receive a sentence. De Francesco on the other hand was put behind bars for 11 years, in 1979 Valenti was tried again for possession of a destructive device and pled guilty. He only received three years probation. Before his trials and indictments started Valenti had already been confronted with the thought of retirement. In 1972 Valenti's consigliere René Picaretto, under boss Samuel Rosati and capo Salvador Gangelo accused him of holding profits to himself so he could buy property in Arizona. Some time later they again approached Valenti and demanded him to give back the money and to step down. Valenti felt disgraced, but did return the money. He however also wanted to punish his men for this. Therefore he ordered his trusted captain Dominic Chirico organize a hit against Gangelo, Rosati, and Picaretto. However, to murder made members of the Mafia Valenti had to get permission of the other families, including the Pittsburgh and Bonanno crime family, under how sanction his organization operated. The answer was no. Rosati, Gangelo, and Picaretto were safe, but had heard of the plot against them and were out for revenge. 
they went to see Bonanno family officials to have their support in the removal and probable murder of Valenti, but their request was also turned down due to Valenti's connections to the La Roca crime family of Pittsburgh. Although they weren't allowed to kill Valenti, they still wanted to have revenge and murdered Dominic Chirico, a loyal Valenti captain. He was killed by a shotgun blast on June 5, 1972. Tensions inside the Valenti family were now running high. On December 15 of the same year, Valenti was convicted of extortion in a case involving a building contractor in Batavia, New York. The Valentis were now officially out of favor in Rochester, their ties to the Pittsburgh crime family slowly vanished. Sam Rosotti became the new boss of Rochester, Gingello became his underboss. Both Frank and his brother Constance Valenti went to live in Arizona and set up minor operations there, but none of these operations were under mafia rule. Frank would live up to the ripe old age of 97 and passed away in a nursing home in Sugar Land near Houston, Texas a wealthy man. In 1977, Picaretto was jailed along with other high-ranking members of the family for the murder of Jimmy Massaro, but were all released a year later when it was revealed that the police had fabricated evidence to gain the convictions. Picaretto continued to operate and eliminate Valenti loyalists. He was seen as Rochester's man. However, in 1984, he was convicted of RICO charges and sentenced to 20 years in prison. While in prison, his son Lauren became underboss of the family after the imprisonment of Richard Marino. He was reportedly released from prison in 2007 and died of natural causes in 2014. Sam Rosati seized control of Rochester's organized crime family in 1972. He was known for his sense of humor, once listing his employment as huckster in the Rochester Suburban Director. He once said he supported himself by gambling and borrowing from his mother. He first went to jail in 1977 for the murder of mobster Vincent Massaro, but the conviction was later overturned because police admitted they fabricated evidence. When Rosati, Rene Picaretto and the other defendants were released from prison, they found a group of rivals had taken over the leadership. Thomas Didio, the man they had picked to run the mob in their absence, refused to relinquish power. Didio was then murdered on July 6, 1978, and his death touched off a bloody bomb filled two years that was dubbed the Alphabet War. The warring factions became known as the A Team and the B Team by police and media. Another rogue crew emerged known as the C Team, consisting mostly of non mate associates. In 84, Rosati and six others were convicted of murdering two of their rivals, as well as attempted murder and extorting millions from illegal gambling in the 1970s and 1980s. Angelo Amico was named acting boss in Rosati absence. Rosati would have been eligible for parole in October 1994, but in 1993, at age 81, he died of a heart attack in a federal prison. He has remained the last don of the Rochester crime family. Law enforcement feel it is highly unlikely that the mafia will ever return to their city. During Amico's reign as acting boss, with so many of the members already in prison, he successfully sustained what was left of the Rochester family until his arrest in 1987. Amico was charged with RICO and tax evasion. He pleaded guilty to the charges and was sentenced to 14 years in prison in October of 1988. He was granted release on parole after serving five years of his sentence in 1993, the same year in which Rosati died in federal prison. By the time of his release, the Rochester crime family had dwindled to practically non-existent. Amico passed away on March 21, 2011, after a losing battle with cancer. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the Everything Network to be notified for more great videos to come. Also subscribe to our Patreon and get access to more videos not found here on YouTube. The link is in the description box.